I'd now like to hand over to our chairman, Winnie Bowman, who's based in South Africa, and she will introduce our speaker today. Over to you, Winnie. Thanks, thanks, Andrea, and uh, welcome everybody and Happy New Year to all of you. And it is lovely, Jancis, to have you here. I have a whole page about you, but we all know everything about you. Um, so I just want to highlight a few things because I'd rather you speak than me speak and take up the time until six o'clock. Mm -hmm. But I actually just read something that Jancis has been a member of the circle for over 50 years. So Nearly 50. Nearly 50 nearly 50, um, which is, I'm sure there are not many people that, that have been here so long. Um, and of course, writer, influencer, OBE, um, many, many, many awards bestowed on her, bangs on the shoulder with swords and all kinds of things, uh, meeting the queen and um, designing her own dishwasher glassware, which to me is one of your best things that you've done because previously I was always too scared to put um, fancy glasses in the dishwasher. So for me, Jancis, personally, thank you. Then um, apart from all your other achievements, I would like to highlight um, one of the things that Jancis has been very involved in is uh, mentoring and um, assisting for sommeliers from Zimbabwe who found themselves in South Africa in order to coach them wine tasting and so much so that they even formed their own team for the uh, World Wine Tasting Championships and Jancis was also very instrumental in setting up a crowdfunding uh, system for them to be able to travel to places and there's also a movie um, to which many people contributed, but the, the main drive of, um, of the fundraising was through Jancis. And if any of you have not seen the movie, it's called Blind Ambition and well worth seeing. Then finally, Jancis loves wine, as we all do, loves wine, as most of us do, in all its glorious diversity and generally favoring balance and subtlety over sheer mass. And she has campaigned for the associated sustainability issues since 2006. Um, we are very much looking forward to this talk on bottle weight. Um, and uh, over to you, Jancis. Thank you very much for those very kind words, especially about the glass. I hope you find it um, really uh, helps the expression of the wines. Um, can you see, I can only see my sort of half my face is all of my face in in pick in view no you're in view Jancis. good thank you um <clears throat> i just hope that my voice will um last for the hour so drinks producers are the world's biggest customers for glass bottles and i would think i don't have the figures the exact split between wine spirits and beer but i would think of those three wine is almost certainly the the biggest um, but glass production and transport, transport before both before and after use, is the number one contributor to wine's carbon footprint. If people analyze carbon footprint of what happens in the vineyard, even what happens in the winery where uh, any fermentation gives off carbon dioxide, it is everything associated with producing and transporting glass bottles that is our, our Achilles heel. Of course, the percentage of wine's total carbon footprint represented by glass bottles varies according to where the bottles are made, where they're filled, uh, where they're shipped, and also where they're disposed of. But it is, and, and so it's probably something like, according to different people's estimates, something like between 30 and 60% of wine's carbon footprint. But it is incontrovertibly the single most important contributor. This is not least because fossil fuels are needed to keep glass furnaces going. They have to be kept 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Because if you switch them off, cool it down, they just, um, you know, everything kind of freezes. Um, and it's and at the moment it is just fossil fuels that are 
heating those furnaces up to 1500 degrees centigrade. I had a very interesting day at a um, glass production site up near Liverpool this year, last year. Uh, and God, it's hot. Um, you know, you can see just how much fossil fuel is used in the production of glass bottles. In the glass industry, they know that um, this, they, they can be accused of this. And there's a lot of talk about alternative energy sources, but nothing so far has uh, is in production. And even if they get the go ahead, say to a conversion from to hydrogen, it's going to be very complicated, very expensive, and will take a long time. So we are, um, every time we open a bottle of wine, we are contributing in quite a major way to wine's carbon footprint. I first wrote about this in 2006, um, and here's what I wrote. I won't read you the whole article, but this is the beginning. Bodybuilder wines are everywhere. This was 2006, the era of big is better. But do we have to have bodybuilder bottles too? Enough already. I've kept quiet on this subject for far too long, but I just can't contain myself any longer. The subject of today's sermon is bottles. This is what I wrote on JancisRobinson.com. Is there any hope that wine producers might think about A, their customers, B, those who sell their wines, and C, the planet, before deciding which sort of bottle to put their precious produce into? No, let's be serious about this. Make that A, the planet, and B, everything else. For what does it matter, my wrestling unsuccessfully to fit a ridiculously tall bottle of Riesling into my refrigerator, or a shelf stacker buckling under the strain of a case of some new icon wine, when the whole planet may implode because of the implications of shipping heavy glass around the, the globe. My principal gripe is with really heavy bottles, whatever is the point of them, other than to satisfy an ego or a marketing concept. That, and more of that ilk. Um, What's strange about this um, supposed link between bottle weight and wine quality is that it's not based on fact. I mean, if you weigh um, a bottle of a first growth, it's not even a bottle of a first growth made in this era, you know, in early uh, 21st century that I'm writing and complaining about, that they weren't especially heavy. Um, it's not that the most important wines in the world were put into heavy bottles. It's a purely spurious connection that I think what was dreamt up by marketeers to make their wines stand out from the crowd. Currently, um, about 550 grams empty is, is about the average bottle weight, but there are a lot more um, bottles, especially in both South and North America, some Spanish regions, some Italian producers, which can weigh almost a kilo, which is using up one heck of a lot of uh, uh, fossil fuel, both in production. <laughs> and transport. Excuse me. Um, there wasn't really much action or awareness of this um, until of this issue, until I'd say this decade, um, when we've all really become much more aware of climate change. And of course, the warming climate has made us so. But now I'm delighted to say there is much, much more awareness. Um, and for instance, Anne Burchett, I don't know if she's here or if she's a member, but she kindly sent me a recent study with a Belgian university and the French glass bottle producer, Viralia, um, which was up to date. There are a lot of old bits of research around there where, um, yes, they're still, they're still consumers thought there was a relationship between bottle weight and wine quality, but more up to date, this one showed that 88 percent of consumers thought light weighting of bottles was a good idea. Um, Dom Deville of the Wine Society, I don't know how many of you have come across him, but 
hats off to the Wine Society for appointing a director of sustainability with true sustainability credentials before uh, joining the wine trade. He also showed me some research from Edelman, the, P the agency, in their Trust and Climate, Climate Special Report about how, in general, globally, people's trust in government and business to tackle climate change is failing. But people do still have trust in science, and they are interested nowadays in climate solutions that help them feel like they're making a difference, especially in the kinds of climate issues they experience in their daily lives. So if we can all make consumers more and more aware of the downside of heavy bottles, I think we will be doing the planet a service. Mind you, there are counter voices. <coughs> I, in my um, FT articles, there's a comment section. And <coughs> some of you may be aware of comment sections. There are where unbridled <coughs> anonymous people make um, often ridiculous comments. Um, here's one. I wrote a sort of survey of, of a review of the year just before Christmas, uh, which mentioned um, light weighting of bottles, I think. And one of the comments was, Genesis has written quite a bit this year about bottle weights and other ESG matters, down which rabbit hole the Wine Society seems intent on going. I don't know how many of her readers care about this stuff. I know I don't. Which is all a bit depressing. Um, equally depressing was when I wrote about the recent Queen of Wong's recent survey of the state of women in the UK wine trade. The first comment was keep wokeism out of wine. Um, but none of them were as bad as the comments when I wrote a, an article about the need for more diversity, um, particularly ethnic diversity in the world of, of wine. And they uh, the comments were so vile, as my editor described them, uh, that they had to disable the comments section. But I was rather proud. I didn't read many of them, but I was rather proud of one of the early ones, which just said Marxist claptrap. <laughs> anyway, on JanicesRobinson.com, for the last three years, we have uh, pursued a policy of deliberately weighing bottles every time we are able to. Obviously, we're not going to hold up a, a trade tasting with our weighing scales. But if we're tasting wines at home, we each have a nice digit, little digital weighing scale. And for practical reasons, we log um, the weight of a full bottle because we don't know how long it's going to... Are we going to give the leftovers to a neighbour? Are we going to taste it over days? You know, it's just much, much easier to, um, to weigh full bottles. And of course, wine itself weighs about 750 grams. So it's pretty easy just to subtract that from our full bottle weights. Um, and I can tell you that the average weight of bottles that we come across has definitely been going down. And perhaps even more significant, because there was a time when uh, light bottles really looked cheap and looked thin. But nowadays, I can no longer tell just by looking at a bottle and actually often even by lifting the bottle, what it weighs. I think bottle manufacturers have become much more um, astute at making good looking bottles that are actually quite light. So let me give you share some examples of what light weighting bottles, the benefits of light weighting bottles. Uh, Jason Huss of Tablas Creek in California, <coughs> reported <coughs> quite some time ago that he had already saved $2.2 million thanks to alternative packaging and lighter bottles. That's a clear advantage for the, the trade. Um, Philip Cox of uh, Rekash, the important Romanian wine exporter, reported some time ago he buys tens of millions of three, six, five gram bottles, which he managed to convince his local factory to produce after what he called a long struggle. This year's Master of Wine Symposium in Wiesbaden 
Dr. Armando Corsi of the University of Adelaide um, established that bottle weight is one of the least important factors when consumers make buying decisions. Far more important factors, as we know, are things like price, personal recommendation, and a familiar name. So all this effort of marketing people to promulgate heavy bottles is not probably making, um, affecting that many buying decisions. Excuse me a moment. Uh, Dr. Chris Borman of the park, that huge bottling place uh, at Avonmouth that's got several Olympic swimming pool sized um, warehouses and so on. Um, they say, he said that they'd been using bottles that were only 330 grams, remember 550 is the average, for 10 years without any significant increase in breakages, even on lines that fill 400 bottles a minute. But he did point out, as did um, Dr. Peter Stanbury, who um, uh, undertook a really detailed analysis of bottle weight and all the factors associated with it for the sustainability wine round table. Um, that what's important is the design of the bottle. You've got to make sure that the shape is uh, correct, that it's, that your bottling line it marries with the shape of the bottle and that the center of gravity of a lightweight bottle needs to be relatively low. And the stress points are very, very important. You can't just say, let's have a bottle that's exactly the same as the one we've been using, but a bit lighter. Um, the One of the most significant um, recent developments um, overseen by the Sustainability Wine Roundtable, and as a result of Peter Stanbury's research, is um, a bottle weight accord at which um, the, the following people have agreed that they will reduce their average bottle weight to below 420, remember 550 is the average, um, by the end of 2026. And they include the all the, the powerful um, nor, uh, Scandinavian monopolies, it's much easier to do this, of course, if you're a monopoly, Whole Foods Market and Naked Wines in the US, Lathwaite's Lidl, Naked Wines, Virgin Wines, Waitrose, important, and the Wine Society, of course, uh, in the UK, and Naked Wines in Australia. And just off, hot off the press is the very useful and important development that Terra Vitis, the French standards group, whose members have between them 45,000 hectares of vines and sell 300 million bottles of wine a year, uh, they have all agreed to join this accord and get their average bottle weight below 420. So I think in, in general, consumers are going to get used to lighter bottles and are no longer, I hope, going to associate them with cheap wine. The, the one thing that I worry about though, because it's this the, the wording is they're going to re reduce their average bottle weight to below 420, I really hope that they're not going to put their sort of smaller quantities of really expensive wine in heavier bottles, because that just reinforces the connection between bottle weight and quality. Um, more good news, Jackson Family Wines, which is a global family owned business headquartered in Sonoma, they're already, they've been like, like they were rather naughty. They had some pretty heavy bottles but have seen the error of their ways, are reducing their bottle weight across the range and are even experimenting with bottles under 400 grams on their biggest bottling line, which is presumably the one that does Kendall Jackson Vintners Reserve Chardonnay. Um, the Cru Bourgeois, I am told, but I haven't seen it in black and white, <coughs> insist that their members put, uh, only use bottles under 400. The Crimson Wine Group in, in the US, which includes named brands like Pine Ridge, Segesio, they say they're aiming to reach an average bottle weight of 400 grams, but by 2028, which is giving them quite a lot of time to do it. Um, I'm told Albert Bichot in Burgundy, who fills six or seven million bottles a year, export to 100 countries, 
uh, have reduced the weight of their bottles from 700 or 750 to 450 at, um, at, with no ill effects on their business. The California wine brand Bonterra is interesting. They are apparently putting the resultant carbon emissions on each of their wine labels. Um, in our, oh, excuse me, in our um, weighing of bottles, on dancesrobinson.com, up to now we've given sparkling wine bottles a pass because of course, um, with all the pressure inside a, a sparkling wine bottle, you, you have got to, it has got to be reasonably heavy. But um, Viralia, um, the French bottle maker, uh, have apparently launched, uh, have, have a, are experimenting with a sparkling wine bottle that's less than 800 grams, which is a whole lot lighter than most sparkling wine bottles. Uh, Champagne Telmo is experimenting with it. And I know for a fact that Bollinger are very much on board with light, light weighting their bottles. So I think um, a house as famous as Bollinger will add um, some impetus to the campaign. And Viralia also have apparently designed a Bordeaux bottle, which is only 300 grams. Uh, so all, you know, for, for quite a time, I was told by people who were buying bottles, wine producers, oh, you know, the bottle producers are not really on board. They're trying to sell us um, bottles that are as heavy as possible because they make more money out of it. I don't think that's true, actually. And I, I'm seeing a lot of activity on the part of bottle manufacturers working with the wine um, the wine industry, which must help. Of course, um, there was a terrible shortage of bottles just as COVID struck and everybody decided they wanted to buy lots of wine to drink at home. Um, there was an important bottle manufacturer in Ukraine, which was one of the first things the Russians struck, which didn't help. And just general shortage of raw materials um, did result in a big shortage of bottles. And so producers had to order a long, long time in advance, pay up front and didn't always get the bottles that they want. But we do have to um, consider not just um, bottle production, but how it gets to the bottling line. And for instance, um, practically all the um, bottle manufacturers in the US have given up because China can produce them much more cheaply, with the result that the great majority of American wine producers are importing empty bottles from China. So shipping air, essentially, across the Pacific, which seems a bit crazy to me. And there are a lot of producers in places in like Australia, South Africa, who want a, a special looking bottle for their produce and are importing empty bottles from Europe. <laughs> so it, it would be wonderful if we could encourage more awareness of all of the implications of not just which bottle is used, but exactly where it comes from. And in all this, you do start to see the advantage of uh, bulk shipping. Um, if you can ship all that quantity of wine uh, without um, in bulk, without the added weight of a whole load of bottles, it must have a huge impact on the carbon footprint. What's funny, in a way, is our attachment to glass bottles for wine. Because, of course, glass is the ideal inert material for a wine that we're going to store away for years and years or decades. There's no question that because there is no interaction between the glass and the wine and the wine that you um, get out, apart from what gets in through the cork, etc. And what's happening in the wine is going to be um, unaffected. That's not the case with um, for some alternative packaging. But when you think that the proportion of all wine produced that is designed to be aged for more than more than a year is awfully small. It probably by volume could be as small as 5%. It's probably, it's certainly no more than 10%. So it's funny that we insist 
on having our wine, even though so much wine is consumed within days, sometimes hours of purchase, we insist on having this inert material, which is heavy, breakable, um, closely associated with carbon emissions, and also in um, such an impractical shape. When you think about a case of wine, there is so much wasted space, isn't there? There's not just the round shape of the bottle, so you've got a sort of lots of wasted space in the corners of the um, square, you know, carton that you're putting in it. But also at the neck, there's even more wasted space. Uh, in California, I came across someone who has designed a hexagonal bottle. The idea being that you waste much less space. That's quite interesting. Had I done this from my desk, I would have shown you, but I'm sorry, I'm incapacitated. So, but imagine it. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot, this may sound heretical, and there are problems with aluminium, certainly, certainly for aging wine in the long term and in terms of production. But I'm actually very pro can for several reasons. There, it's non-breakable, it's lightweight, it can be recycled. Um, and, you know, when we're all tearing our hair out about young people not getting into wine, it's not that surprising when they have to fork out for a full 75 centilitres of it, plus, in most cases, a special instrument to get into the bottle, i.e. a corkscrew. Whereas a can is so simple, much cheaper, portable, um, and sort of non-threatening in a way that I think um, pulling a cork can be. Uh, bag in box, very, very space efficient. Although um, perhaps, I uh, know this is uh, Trevor Gulliver's special subject. Um, the taps can be tricky for recycling. Um, we've probably all seen the flat recycled pet plastic bottle, which has a lot of advantages to it. It is recycled, can be recycled several times. It's very light. Um, my only, and you know, what we've got to realize is, uh, is that plastic itself is not evil. It's what we do with plastic. If we chuck it into the ocean, that is a very bad thing. But if we're careful with it and we recycle it, uh, it can be a very useful material. Uh, recycling is a major, major issue. And in Britain, sadly, we're not very good at it. In the US, they're even worse at it. Um, I think can, where you've got a monopoly, you can have an efficient recycling system. I, I believe the LCBO in Ontario collects bottles. Um, but we are in Britain, we are much worse than the Scandinavian countries or Germany or Switzerland. And France even is a lot better than us, excuse me. <coughs> so the trouble is, recycling in Britain at the moment is in the power of individual local authorities, none of whom can necessarily talk to each other. Um, so we have a very fragmented recycling system and pretty inefficient, I, I think, um, which is a great shame. However, the glass manufacturers are doing their best to keep increasing the proportion of recycled glass in bottles. They can't, if, if it goes very high, then um, the glass starts to sort of, has a bit of a bubble in it, doesn't look very clear. What a lot of people don't realize is that those clear bottles that fashionable Provencal Rosé comes in are pretty unecological because they have to be made from non-recycled glass to be totally clear. Um, and, and hats off to um, the LVMH uh, Rosé that decided to put their design their new bottle with recycled glass. So it is all a bit sort of pale greeny and so forth. Um, I'm not talking about Whispering Angel, by the way. Um, Philip Cox, again, gave an interesting um, bit of information. He's, he'd studied it. This is from Romania. We found that 70% of a glass bottle's carbon emissions occur after they're produced with things like recycling. Because when you think about it, there's a lot of transport involved in recycling. 
So, and the more you move a bottle, the more carbon CO2 is emitted. So it is a very complex issue and I'm just throwing, I haven't, I don't have a silver bullet. I'm just throwing considerations at you. But I think the the overall message must be um, that doing what we can to uh, encourage producers and consumers to break that link between bottle weight and perceived quality, we'll be doing the planet a favor. There are returnable bottles. Um, no, nothing has really got off the ground on a global scale for obvious reasons. Um, Styria, I think, has its own recycling system. And uh, I think it, they do it through the local supermarkets, which I can see working. Um, but it is difficult, isn't it? I think you'd have to be in a wine region and agree and I have everybody agree what the favoured bottle was. And then you've got to factor in the energy used to transport the bottles and to clean them. There is someone in um, California trying to get a scheme off the ground. I think actually she's in Napa. Um, but I, I think, as I say, I think we should just put pressure um, as much as possible and, and keep educating consumers. Incidentally, um, most of you will know um, uh, Nicole Sierra Rolle from Schenbler. Julia and I um, spent an early evening with her and her husband, who used to be the head of London Stock Exchange, Xavier Rolle, um, just before they set off to Harvard for a year's study of regenerative viticulture and agriculture, respectively. And uh, Xavier is super bright, so he's been reading around the subject enormously. And he pointed out to me that those in the know um, point out that what we're doing to our ocean, oceans, is even worse than what we're doing to our atmosphere. And I suppose wine's uh, contribution to ocean pollution is through agrochemicals. And so that's something that we all have to bear in mind. But I can see a million questions here. Shall I have a go at answering those that I can? Yeah, uh, Yeah. there's a number of observations. There's one or two questions, I think, Jancis. The first, okay. if you go down, the first one was um, Dominic Buckwell asking about proportions yeah. of damage from carbon emissions, but I think you answered that. Um, I, can, I can see all the questions, actually. Okay. Um, and no, I, uh, I don't, I mean, we don't even have an incontrovertible figure for the proportion of glass bottles in toto. Um, I think I, I circulated that graphic to you, didn't I, from um, Wines of California. Do you remember? Perhaps I can look it up, which, at, which suggest, like, I can get a little, I just hope I don't lose you. Um, I'll try and perhaps get back to that at the end. Um, someone sending me a, uh, an interesting pertinent recent article from Oregon. Um, uh, yeah, this is somebody nicely pointing out that Mouton has <clears throat> what they call jumped on the bottle weight marketing bandwagon and the difference in weight between pre 2000 bottles and two th post 2000 is significant. I'm assuming Rebecca, you mean the lighter now? Uh, I hope so. Um, and, you know, I don't mind if people are boasting about lightweighting bottles. I just want them to lightweight them. Um, let's see. Some large wine producers say they can't use lighter bottles because they can't buy them. Lighter bottles aren't produced them. What is your opinion on this and what can we do about this together? It's certainly true. Um, I don't know that, I think, I don't think it's large wine producers specifically. I think it's wine producers in general, and it just depends where they are um, and how um, advanced the thinking of their bottle pro producers are. It is a bit frightening how far many empty bottles travel. But again, this is an issue that we can publicize. Um, LCBO launched its own program to require producers to comply with their requirements of bottle weights in the previous decade, had success with cooperation from international producers. So if 
So, I mean, LCBO is quite an important <laughs> customer. It's not the world's biggest, although Canadians have been told that it is. I did a calculation some time ago to work out that Tesco actually buys more wine than LCBO. Um, but you would think that if an international producer has gone to the trouble of putting its wine in a lighter bottle for LCBO, it could do it for everybody. And SAQ in Quebec as well. As I say, monopolies are in a brilliant position and virtually all of them have taken a stand on this. I don't know about Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, but all the Scandinavians have, yeah. Um, and somebody else uh, confirming other um, Canadian monopolies have, and Norway, yeah. Um, yeah, this is someone else pointing out that the uh, Vinmopolet, which I learned to produce, which I've just forgotten, uh, the, the Norwegian wine monopoly, um, they have a mandatory maximum weight for all wines under a certain price but uh, that's a bit of a shame to me because that again is saying you know if it's a fancy wine it's allowed to be in a heavy bottle and the, and it's reinforcing that connection um angela lloyd thank you andrea molyneux tells me their lightest wines are 395 for their clue street brand um, that's already so light that one cannot lay the bottle flat for storage or shipping, only upright. Why? I wonder why. I can't see why a, a light bottle can't be laid flat, but, uh, laid laid horizontal. Because oh, they, bro they break if you lay them flat. Really? Yeah. Oh, gosh. This is the doctor ringing. <laughs> and they're so... Oh, I'm so sorry, but I feel I've got to... Um, answer it because it's hen's teeth the call from the doctor hello Stephen. i don't know if you want to say anything follow up with anything that jance is the last point that jance was just talking about yeah i mean in the practical terms in a winery you know you ha you usually have a certain change parts as they call them for machines and they're very expensive you don't want to change uh change parts too often just because of the expense and the downtime but but the thing is if you as you lighten a bottle take the glass out of it if you keep to the exterior dimensions you get more volume yeah, yeah. So you have to change the shape of the bottle in order to accommodate to keep to the diameter which is important and keep to the height the height is less important because you can change the machine quite easily but those those clanking you go to a bottling line the clanking bits that clank round and round and transfer it from you know the the rinser to the to the bottle or the bottle to the cork or the cork to the capsule all of those have to be they're set for a certain diameter so as you say if you keep the same diameter and, and use less glass the inside gets bigger so what you have yeah. to do is you have to make say take a bordeaux bottle the shoulder has to has to lower and the neck has to get longer it looks completely out of proportion but there are you know there are the way around it is obviously is to, is to alter your machine but but people sort of feel reluctant because they think that a lot of things are changing in the next few years on bottles. Um, so they're reluctant to sort of spend £5,000 on a new set of change parts for bottles that might not be made in the future. Sorry, has Jen just got in off the... Yeah, she just had to go. She just had to take a call from her doctor, unfortunately. Oh, she's still on it. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if you're able... You know about the Ken Kendall Jackson, the producers pledging to lightweight their bottles. I don't know. We went for a, a lot on the MW tour to California. We went went for a sustainability meeting, and they gave us wine out of. I think Rosemary was there. I think we they gave us wine out of very heavy bottles, and I asked the sustainability guy, "What about the bottle size?" He said, "Oh, that's not my department." Mm. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of people talking about lightning. Lightning, using lighter weight bottles. I don't know if Rebecca wants to come in here because she was the one that put the put the question forward. Rebecca, are you there? Hi, uh, I am. Go ahead, Rebecca. Um, right. So this uh, a lot of the um themes that uh, that James has mentioned seem to me to be working, even though they're working with large producers and, you know, I mean, you have people on board like Whole Foods Market, um, 
to pledge to lighten their bottles from somebody who works with collectors in the U.S. who are ordering specifically from, you know, mostly Napa, but California producers, this seems like a bottom-up approach, right? Um, that you need to also focus on the top of the market, the most expensive bottles, right? Is just sort of my thoughts. And, and get these collectors to accept that their Schaefer and their $200 and $250 and $300 bottles of direct-to-consumer wines also don't need to be in bottles that you know weigh five pounds each. So. Yeah, I think that's the point that Jancis was making, wasn't it? That she needs to, you need to target the top end of the market, not just the, the lower price wines. I don't know if anybody else has a comment to make on that. This is Meg, I'll jump in. I know that Tablas Creek, which Jancis mentioned, um, has put their premium rosé in bag and box and sold through. Um, that's a wine that's not meant to age. It's meant to be consumed very young. And I wonder if um, the, you know, the question is if it's a collector who's, uh, Rebecca, maybe you can answer this for us, but if you're working with collectors who are collecting Icon Napa cabs that are gonna be aging 10, 15, 20 years, they do need to be in a non-permeable um, vessel. Obviously bag and box isn't gonna work. And I think it'll be millennia before we get them to accept cans. But what what do you think they would accept if you work with these people? What what do you What do you feel would be an acceptable solution at the high end? Well, I'm not saying get rid of bottles for those wines. Um, I'm purely talking about the weight of the bottles. Um, I mean, you know, all uh, credit to Screaming Eagle and to Harlan, Screaming Eagle Moore, with, whose bottles are not heavy, um, not over the top heavy. Uh, and yet, I think they've been doing that for a few years, and yet I don't see that translating, right, into these other icon Napa wines same way uh, thank you for that 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 makes that makes sense i mean i think that the embossed bottles and all the other specializations that people put in the glass to try to make it seem unique and br it's brand positioning in a sense right um it's going to be hard for it them is. To and, and, and it's part of their marketing and if they're doing direct to consumer marketing which almost all of them are right they, they feel that's very important but i also just uh, had a shipment of Venge come in, which is a, a Napa, I believe it's Napa icon wine. Um, and the styro was totally destroyed because of the weight of the bottles, right? First of all, they shouldn't have been shipping the styrofoam, but they did. Um, but I'm shocked that no bottles broke because the shipping packaging was destroyed by the weight of the bottles. Um, so on multiple fronts, they could save money shipping, they could save money on lighter glass, they could probably have less breakage in shipping to the consumers. Um, it seems to me like there needs to be a focus on reaching those producers. And I was just wondering if, if there had been any conversations about that. I think while Jancis is uh, on the phone, there's another thank you for that. The other uh, comment or observation met, met noted by Nicole Wolvers is saying that in Germany, different eco labels wanted to join forces to put pressure on glass producers to offer lighter bottles. The problem is the organizations have to agree on the same shapes of bottles and convince their wineries from different countries to join. It seems they are still working on that and there is a long way to go. Uh, Hi there, sorry. Um, I was expect I had a call booked from about 6.41 and they decided to call me at 5.41. And uh, 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 us, and they're saying can't confirm you have whooping cough unless you come in, okay. and appointments are non-existent. No. And by the by, uh, so what have I missed? Well, we were just talking. We were just covering a, a point made about lighter weight bottles used by producers that produce uh, top end wines. Um, from a question from Rebecca Malsteiner. Um, and she was wondering, there's a long way to go to convince these producers to also go to lightweight bottles. 
Um, hang on. But I mean, uh, Kendall Jackson are going lighter weight for their smart wines as well. In fact, I've, I've noticed that um, considerably. Um, but the trouble is, of course, we see we're kind of a vintage or two behind, aren't we, on the marketplace? So I think that answers that. Are you, and then the Venge, Darius, and Schaefer in particular, they're heavy bottles, I'm presuming. Yeah. They are very heavy. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, yeah, and so's um the one that's just sold itself for a million millions, um, beginning with D, Dow, whatever it's called, you know, in um Paso Robles. You know, yeah. So my question, uh, Jancis, was uh, are you aware of any conversations with some of these luxury California producers in order to change? Or do you think the focus is in having consumers realize from the bottom up, right, with the Kendall Jackson and the people who are on board that heavier is not better and hoping that that trickles up, so to speak? Or there's nothing wrong with obviously both um, a pincer movement. But for instance, last April, I gave a talk, um, admittedly to Napa Green, so it was a slightly convinced um, audience, but there were a lot of high-end producers there uh, on this subject. I think it is getting through. It's, and I think, it, I, I, know, I, I think the last bastion is gonna be the, the big, um, you know, Old fashioned Napa cabs, for instance, there's already a, a massive difference, isn't there, between the bottles they use and say the likes of Matthiasen and so forth. But, you know, if they no notice that um, there are many arenas in which younger producers are doing better than they are, maybe that will have a, an effect. What else is there? What will be your formula for the best? wine bottle if a winery is not ready to move to a can. Oh, Chandra. Well, just a, a lighter one, really. Um, I think timing is very important. Um, Joanna said about Coke doing a huge effort to educate consumers on recycling with weak results. I wonder when that was and whether it was, you know, this series of really hot summers and 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 floods and so forth, I think is driving the message home um, recently, whereas five years ago, people would go, oh, well, not for me. <coughs> um, in Germany, different eco labels wanted to join forces. Problem, the, organi the organization have to agree on the same shapes. I know this is a problem because everybody thinks their, um, uh, you know, their bottle is special and they've just got to get over it. Um, and of course, it, it's co it takes a huge amount of, of money to make special um, molds. You know, each, each um, bottle shape and bottle design needs a mold. I wonder if Jason Hass's uh, financial argument um, couldn't be brought into play here. Um, <coughs> let me see. Um, <coughs> yes, the sustainable wine solutions, that, that's Borough, isn't it? Um, which are doing well. Um, oh dear, thank you, Rebecca, this is bad news. Well, they're out of date, aren't they? Yes, I should have known that. Um, yeah, I think I will. Um, that's interesting. Um, well, perhaps a, a bit of pressure is needed. Um, direct pressure to Mouton in particular. Make myself a note. Write myself a note. Um, 
problem with PET and the plastic lines of cans is the migration, yes. So, but that that's a problem over the long term, but how many of these wines in PET and and in cans are drunk more than a month even after sale, I wonder. Um, so another question about the color of glass, does it add to the CO2? My think, my belief is that the, the color of glass is um, important for recycling, but not, I don't think the color has a, an effect on the amount of carbon footprint, but I could stand corrected if someone knows more than me. Um, imperfect bottles can be made, yes. Um, you know, we, we as I was saying, say about that LVMH rosé, it's not a kind of perfect colour, but it does advertise its sustainable credentials very loudly. <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, for um, a sparkling wine, I think um, nearly a kilo is standard. And Meg is telling us it's more it's more like 900, thank you. Uh, recent trip to South Africa, bottle weight, suggesting supply chain. Yes, well, there was a big shortage of, of bottles. Um, yeah. Well, serious damage. I don't think we're doing serious damage. I think we're just spreading the word that, um, uh, and, and, you know, that, they don't have to take, no bottle producer should only be supplying heavy bottles and it's up to the wine trade to put pressure on them and, and explain why. Sorry to be sound, sounding so unsympathetic. Paula, um, yeah, the BDP, because those GG bottles were quite heavy, weren't they? So it'd be great if they've come up with a lighter design. Um, I say the former chief of producers. That's true. There is a, there are waste bags uh, in flexi tanks. So this is an example of just how <coughs> complex the whole issue is, um, and you do have to take into account every little detail. Which is why it's great that retailers like the Wine Society have been do and and the um, monopolies have been doing that. Have been absolutely and waitrose i think um have been doing a really detailed study and not just saying oh we'll use lighter glass but looking at every aspect um they have such a positive image um yeah you're you're right jason jason huss works very hard um and is a sort of great ambassador for um uh, alternative packaging and lighter packaging. Here's Dominic, another long one. Um, oh, that's the same one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stephen Skelton. At least glass can be 100% recycled, but um, I agree. One answer is much better recycling systems. Uh, that's what we need. Um, any thoughts on increasing uh, consumer interest, which would result in increased pressure on producers? Well, there are retailers as well to put pressure on, um, because as we've seen, if if important retail customers like the monopolies in, insist on something, it happens, uh, like with um, worker conditions in South Africa, for instance. Here it is. The new GG bottle weighs five eighty down from seven fifty. Well, that's that's definitely an improvement. Um, are we going to be able? I can't remember whether you can save comments, Andrea. Can you? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. that'd, be, that'd be good. Um, and yes, this is a very good point that younger consumers are much more driven by sustainability issues. I suspect the age of that person who said I couldn't care less in the FT comments is not young. Um, so how do we articulate the issues to them? Um, just keep banging on about it. 
Um, have a day. Good. Um, good. Yes. If if I if I come across a really ridiculously heavy bottle, and I think I've more or less eliminated polystyrene. If ever um, I have a kind of um, document, if anyone's sending me a sample, and in red across the top I say, "Do not use polystyrene." or styrofoam, um, because it tends to go straight to landfill, even those that are stamped recyclable. Um, so it, and what I think one of the most positive um, developments in recent years has been designs of the um, cardboard carton manufacturers who have much, do you remember when bottles used to rattle around in um, cardboard cartons, but now they've come up with so many more designs of, um, cartons that are, that really keep bottles safe. I, I can't remember the last time I had a, a broken bottle in a, a cardboard box. Occasionally, when someone delivers bottles loose in a carrier bag, that's a different <laughs> matter. Um, uh, the only, yeah, about flat bottles, my only criticism of them is that their uh, centre of gravity is much higher than with um, conventional bottles, and it's quite easy to knock them over. I have a feeling that um, the people who make them also produce little stands for them. Um, somebody might know that. Now, we're coming up to the time when my voice is going to give out, I'm afraid. Um, just quickly, how many young people listen to podcasts? Well, we had a podcast, I think, on Bottle Weight, that's at Johnson.com. Um, Good. Yeah, wine in UHT containers, which is another possibility, which I didn't mention. Um, good. Well, sorry, but my voice is worn out. And I'm really sorry that um, the doctor called one hour before it was supposed to. Um, but thank you very, very much for all your very, very interesting input. And um, please keep hammering home the message. <laughs>